Let's read. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried jo Jacob, their father, their little ones, and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters all his offspring he brought into him, with him into Egypt. This is the word of God. Praise be to God. Please have a seat. My family immigrated to the United States when I was in third grade, 2002, June 25th, in Korean, Yu-Gi-Oh. And that's the day, it's 2002, World Cup. That's the day we lost to Germany. <laughs> Fun fact. You know, the news that we are immigrating to the U.S. Uh, came to me as a surprise that we are moving to America to leave behind my friends, our extended family in Korea, to begin a new life in a foreign land. I remember pretty clearly the last day in my school in Korea. I remember my mom, she came to pick us up in the middle of the day, and it was a pretty tear-filled day in my memory. And personally, uh, the first few years in the U.S. Uh, were filled with lots of difficulties, lots of confusions, and lots of hardship for me because I didn't understand anything at the time. I didn't understand English. I didn't understand the culture. And I learned that I am different from everyone else as one of the few, one of the few Asians in a predominantly white community. My family also faced some hardship as well. The pressures of starting a new life and settling down in a new country is sometimes just unbearable. I think many of us can relate it's the kind of hardship, hardship that all immigrant families know well. But in hindsight, in hindsight, though there were many difficult situations in life, me and my family, our lives are definitely characterized by the blessings that God has poured on us rather than the hardships that we endured. You know, often I speak to my mom uh, about these past days, about how amazing God's plan is, how intricate and how intentional and how detailed his plans are for us, how he keeps his promises and how we can trust him now for future hardships because of our past experiences. And in our passage today, Israel, who is Jacob, Jacob's family is led by God into a foreign land. We could definitely say they are immigrants in Egypt. And surely there are hardships to come, as we all know, in this foreign land. There will be unforeseen difficulties, difficulties unimaginable. But today, in our passage, God reminds us that our lives are dependent not on the circumstances, not on where we live, not on what we eat, not on the environment or the people in power, but only on the grace of God. Amen? God reminds Israel today that it is by His grace 
that he, he, that he will lead them into Egypt, that by his will, by his grace, that he will fulfill his promises. Let's look at verse 1 together. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. Where is Beersheba? You know, throughout this series, the Covenant Generation series, throughout the last 27, uh, 26 sermons, we mentioned Beersheba uh, a, a handful of times. The first time we were introduced to Beersheba was with Abraham in chapter 21. Abraham and Abimelech make a covenant together at Beersheba. And Abraham is given a well of water a permanent residence in the land of the Philistines. It was a way for God to make good on his promise to Abraham that he will have land. Then we are introduced to Beersheba once again in uh, chapter 26, and this time with Abraham's son Isaac, where the Lord appears to Isaac and reminds him of the promise that he had made with his father Abraham. He says to Isaac, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not. For I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So Isaac, having heard this promise from God, builds an altar there to worship the Lord. He called upon the Lord's name at this place, Beersheba. And it is the same place that we are at today where Jacob, Isaac's son, and Abraham's grandson comes, he comes with his whole family to worship God and to offer sacrifices to God. Beersheba is a place where Abraham experienced the promise of God being fulfilled in his life. It is a place where Isaac was given a promise by God, by words, fear not, he said, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring. It is now a place where Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who is, called, uh, uh, who is called Israel, now comes. And in the middle of this famine, is on his way to meet his son, who he thought was dead for the past 22 years. On his way of immigrating to Egypt, a foreign land. He stops at Beersheba, this place where promises are fulfilled to worship God. And it is here in this same place where God spoke to his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac that God speaks to Israel. Verse 2, 3, and 4. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. God speaks to Israel, to Jacob, in this vision. And he reminds Jacob of his faithfulness, of his promises. It is during a famine, right? A crazy famine during another uncertain time in Jacob's life that God appears and he reminds him, Jacob, I got you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to remain faithful to you. Don't look at the circumstances. Do not be afraid. I know you're going into a foreign land. I know you're afraid. But don't be, because I myself will go down to Egypt with you. So when Jacob sees this vision in the night, he must have been reminded of a promise that God gave to him 40-some years ago. He must have remembered. He must have been reminded of that fateful night when Jacob was just a young boy running for his life from his older brother to his uncle's house. Jacob 
he must have remembered that cold night, that first night he spent in the wilderness all by himself, when God appeared to him in a vision on top of the ladder. Forty some years ago, Genesis 28, 13 to 15. This is 40 some years ago. He, God says to him, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you. And I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what, ha what I have promised you. Amen. Jacob must have been rem reminded when he comes with all of his family to worship God at Beersheba. When he sees this vision of the night, he must have been reminded of this promise that God gave him 40 some years ago. He must have known that God made good on his promise already. God showed grace to him before. Jacob fled to his uncle's house, to Laban's house, right? Esau was out to kill him. And he found a family there. He married Rachel and Leah. He had sons there. He built up his livestock, his, his resources, his belongings. And then he returned home by the grace of God. Jacob must have been reminded of God's grace and faithfulness that God has shown to him already during another uncertain, during the hardship, during the confusion of his life. And now here Israel and his whole household along with his sons and daughters as he is being relocated to a foreign land in the midst of this harsh famine, Israel is reminded once again of God's grace, of his faithfulness. God reminds him of the promise that he once made to him 40 some years ago. And he tells him, God, God has not given up on his promises. God reminds him that his promises endure. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, he says. For there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph hand, Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Can you imagine that? God says he himself will go down to Egypt with Jacob. But here is the tension in the story. Here is where we got to really think. God, you are all-knowing. You are all-knowing, aren't you? And you know that Israel, when they go into Egypt, after some time, they will actually become slaves here. God, don't you know that? Don't you know that for actually 400 years, that the Israelites will serve as slaves in the land of Egypt. God, are you really leading them into your promise? Why does it seem like you're leading them into their demise? Are you not leading them into suffering? God, Jacob and his household are already living in the land of the promise. They are already living in Canaan. They are already living a good, settled life. Why? Why did you send this famine to take Jacob's family to, into Egypt that the Israelites would become slaves? Only to bring them back through Exodus and to bring them back to the land that they are already in now. Why? Brothers and sisters, what do you think? Is God a good God? Is God a faithful God? Is God a gracious God? Brothers and sisters, here is the truth. 
God's promises do not fail. God's promises endure, amen? God is good all the time, regardless of our circumstance or our situation. In good times and the bad, in the health and sickness, in sorrow and joy, God's promise endures. That is the truth. How do we know that this is true? Because in Jacob's life, we have already seen it. That God is gracious, God is faithful, that his promise endures. When things looked like it was over, when Jacob was running for his life from his older brother, when, when Laban, his uncle, lied to him about Rachel and Leah, when Joseph was thrown into the pit, when Joseph was accused unjustly, when Joseph was thrown into prison, when it looked like the story was all but over, in that hopelessness, it was made clear, was it not? That no matter the circumstance, no matter how dark and bleak the situation may be, the promise that God made to his people does not fail. Yes, God is the one who said it. I will bring you back to this land. He said this to him. He said this to Jacob once before. And it was so. God said, I will be with you. And it was so. God said, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For I will make you into a great nation. I will go down with you to Egypt. And it will be so. Because God's promise are sure. Because God's promise, his Grace is dependent on the unchanging, the immutable, always good, always present, all-knowing, and all-powerful God himself. God's promises must be true. Why? Because God is true. God's promises must endure. Why? Because God endures. God's promises are forever. Why? Because God is forever. But as often is the case, God's promises are fulfilled in the most unexpected ways. God's promise is not fulfilled in the land of promise where Jacob is already living. No, God's promise is fulfilled in Egypt in a foreign land. The rest of chapter 46, it lists all the men in the house of Jacob. All the sons of the 12 sons of Israel. If you count them, there are 70 men in the household of Jacob at this time. With their wives and children who are not named here, we could assume that there are anywhere from 100 to 200 individuals in the house of Jacob being relocated into Egypt. God's promise is that they would be a great nation. 200 people is not a great nation, is it? But that's what God has promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when God makes good on his promise... When God makes good on his promise to bring them back out of Egypt into the land that he promised. Do you know how many men came out of Egypt? 600,000 men of Israel came out of Egypt. Brothers and sisters, God's promise endures. God's grace is forever. It is fulfilled in unimaginable, incomprehensible, and immeasurable ways. Brothers and sisters, be reminded today of God's faithfulness, God's great grace in your life. God's promise is not inaccessible in Egypt. Even in slavery, God's promises are true. No matter where you are, no matter what your circumstances may be, whether you're in school or not, whether you have a job or not, whether you're healthy or not, God's promise is sure. God is faithful and he is with you. 
And he says, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. Verse 5, then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, their little ones, and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, all his offspring he brought into, with him into Egypt. Let me end with this. Jacob takes his whole family, his sons and their offsprings, his daughters, his son's daughters, it says. All of his offspring he brings into Egypt in the middle of a harsh famine. This is a gold opportunity that many in this area in that time would have wished for. This is a lifeline. There must be so many people in this region trying to make it through the seven years of harsh famine. But in this impossible circumstance, when people around them are dying of starvation, Jacob and his family, the whole household of Israel, is welcomed welcomed, invited into the land of Egypt through that boy, through a boy they thought was dead. Joseph should have been dead. Jacob's sons told him so. But through God's unforeseen and amazing grace, the household of Jacob is invited to Egypt, to escape to a land that has already prepared for this famine, a land that God prepared for them. But brothers and sisters, let me remind you, the house of Jacob is not accepted into Egypt because Joseph is powerful. It's not because Joseph is the number two the house of Jacob is not accepted into Egypt because they have something to offer to the Egyptians. That's not true at all. The house of Jacob is accepted into Egypt because Joseph forgave his brothers. Because Joseph showed grace to his brothers. When Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers last week, when he said, I am Joseph, not only was he revealing his own identity, but he was revealing what? The brothers' sin against Joseph. The fact that they sold him into slavery, that they conspired against him. And because of this truth, because of their wrongdoing, because of their sin, they trembled. They thought that Joseph would imprison them right then and there. That he would kill them. That Joseph would take revenge to find justice by his own hands. But Joseph shows them grace. Joseph forgives them. That is why the house of Jacob is welcomed invited into the land of Egypt. All the events since the covenant given to Abraham in Genesis 15 and all the events to happen until God sends a deliverer in Moses to rescue the Israelites from Egypt, grace is at the most pivot, pivotal point of it all. Grace that Joseph showed to his family is at the center. To the family that wronged him. To the family that forgot about him for 22 years. To the family that sold him for 20 pieces of silver. Joseph showed grace. Grace is at the center of our story. 
grace is at the center of our lives. All the events of your life and mine since the birth, since our birth into this world until the last moments of our lives, grace is at the center of it all. It is by God's grace. It is by grace of God shown to us, poured out to us, that we have been forgiven of our sins. By the grace of God, we are redeemed. When Jesus came, when Jesus came into this world and he said, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God, not only did he reveal his identity to us, but he revealed our sins, our wrongdoings, our transgressions. He revealed that we are completely unworthy, unholy, wretched, and broken. But in his great grace, he forgave our sins. When we rejected him, when we forgot about him, when we sold him off for a few pieces of silver, God showed us grace. And by this grace, we are saved through faith. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Brothers and sisters, be reminded of his grace today, that from the famine of our souls, that we have been rescued, that from the depths of hell, we have been delivered. Do not be afraid to go into Egypt. God will be with you. God will be faithful to you. God will be gracious to you. Let's pray.